Hello, you guys. My name is Tiffany Taylor, and I am going to lead us in our final Richest Man in Babylon Zoom. So for those of you that have participated in this round of the Coach Budgeting Basics, we've been going over this book called The Richest Man in Babylon by George Klassen, and it's this book that's written like a bunch of really old parables, and it's really neat because the parables make understanding the laws of acquiring wealth very easy and um, anybody can grasp it. So I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your week. I know it's Thanksgiving, so many of you are traveling. Um, I appreciate you joining us tonight. And also if you're not able to join us live and you're watching the replay, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch the replay. I know that time is your most valuable asset and I'm appreciative of yours. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. We've been going over a couple stories each week. First, we walked through the seven cures for a lean purse, so how to make your purse fatter. The biggest one of those rules being a tenth of everything you earn is yours to keep. Um, that, that goes right in hand with the lesson that you can live off of seven tenths of what you make. You should save another one of those tenths for you, and then the other two tenths can go to pay off debtors or creditors. And um, or go into savings and eventually be invested to make money for you. So we've, we've gone through all these stories. We have three more to touch on tonight. And I am just going to give a brief recap of each of the three because these stories have a lot of banter between the individuals. And I want to encourage you to go read them. I mean, we are at the end of the book. I think most of you that are following along have probably already finished. But please go read these last three stories. So we're going to dive right in. And this this third to last lesson is about the camel trader and it's really talking about debt and Dabasir is the main character and he has somebody who owes him money and he runs into him on the street and he's like do you have my money and the guy's like no I've fallen onto such hard times I never have good luck this and that he's like I don't have your money so Dabasir gets frustrated and is like come with me come on sit down you got to sit down you got to listen to me we got to talk and they have lunch and what happens is Dabasir tells Tarkad his story about when he was so far in debt, he literally became a slave. Literally. He was literally enslaved to an owner because he, he had lost his ass to debt is what happened. So the first lesson in that story, in the Camel Trader story, is that purchasing what you cannot afford on credit will quickly spiral out of control. So part of Dabasir's backstory was that at first he was able to both earn the money to live and pay off his debts, but his appetite could no longer be sati satiated like for more material possessions. And so he kept spending more and more and more and taking on more debt until eventually he found himself with more debt than he could repay. Been there. Mm. Sure have. I'm sure some of you have too. And that's why we're doing this. So we're on the up and up and making wiser decisions. So let me say that again. He found himself with more debt than he could repay. So in order to avoid this situation, purchasing on credit should be avoided should be avoided, should be avoided unless you're, unless you're in great, great, great need. You know what I mean? Um, we also have a general rule of thumb at our office, my financial planning office in Southlake, that if it is not an appreciating asset, which means it goes up in value, don't borrow to buy it, which would mean your car depreciating, don't borrow to buy it. And I know some of you could argue with me because you can get real low interest. I'm just saying as a general rule of thumb, if it's not an appreciating asset, nope, don't do it. So that was the first lesson in that, that one story. And then there's a second lesson, which is more targeted towards those who are already indebted. And it's that leaving your debts unpaid can eventually just take over. Um, and like in Dabasir's case, he literally was forced to live as a slave. Literally, he became a slave. So it can be this, the same, though, for anyone who's enslaved like by their own desires. So you can become addicted to it. You can become addicted to borrowing and borrowing and acquiring and needing these material possessions and in such a way that you create a habit where it's like you buy something and then um, you get a feeling of gratification and it's wrong and you have to break that cycle. So the, the lesson at the very end of all these stories is when he's finally like had enough. So the idea is he became a slave. He was enslaved. And what he's trying to tell this friend, he's like, I've been where you've been. But the idea is when you finally had enough, when you finally say, that's it, I, I want to live as a free man. I don't want to live as a slave any longer. I don't want to be enslaved to my debt or to these creditors that I'm constantly having to pay. You make a decision. 
you get up and you work hard and you don't quit. Even if all you can tell your debtors is I don't have anything to give you except for my hard work and I'm willing to work off my debt for you. You go to every single one. And some of them, when you come to them, just like they did with Davisir, like some of them were mean and they like um, shunned him and others were appreciative that he was coming back and facing it. It's never, if you've ever had an unpaid debt, it's never comfortable to go and address that debt after the fact. It really isn't. Um, but if you do and you start to pay it off, there is a great peace of mind that comes with that. So Davisir proves that he's in fact his own master, even though he was a slave and that he was in control of himself and his desires. So if one should find themselves buried in debt, no matter how deep of a hole that you're in, once the determination is found to get out of the debt, a way to get out of it will be soon to follow. So it's like once you found that determination, there's nothing that's going to get in your way. So what's the lesson here? Don't borrow unless it's an absolutely, absolutely, absolutely dire situation or for an appreciating asset. And of course, there's other rules there. Don't like just take me on that. The next section or the second to last story is about the clay tablets of Babylon. And I'm going to run through these quick, 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 quick. But basically, it goes through the story that I didn't just get into with you guys that I said had all the banter. And it walks you through Davisir's um, journey to freedom. But what's interesting is, okay, so this whole book, if you read the book, is all these old Babylonian um, parables or little stories. And here in this section, it reverts back to modern time, which in this case was like 1929, 1930. And it's a letter between this man named Alfred and a professor Caldwell. And the man named Alfred is just explaining that there was an archaeological dig in Babylon. They found some clay tablets with Davisir's story, and this is what they were. So tablet number one begins with Davisir returning from Syria with the determination to repay that debt right? We were just talking about that. He, he had finally decided he was going to do it and there was nothing that was going to get in his way. And so the entablets engraved shortly after uh, a gold lender helps him get a camel job. Okay. And he explains that he's first going to set aside one tenth of everything he earns and he's going to save it. And then he states that he's going to use seven tenths to take care of himself and his wife. So to keep his house in order. And then it goes to tablet number two. All right, so I want you to pause. I want you to think about this. Dabasir, if you read that story about the camel trader, Dabasir was in such dire straits. Like he was literally on his way back to Babylon and he ran out of water, food, um, probably clothing. It was hot. He was on the desert. His camels were exhausted. He didn't know if he could make it and he figured, oh, I just might as well die. That's what he did. That's where he was, like in the desert, about to die, camels panting. I'm sure he stunk really bad, but he could see Babylon or he could see, you know, that he had, he was almost on his way out. And so he mustered up that determination. He got up and they made it. And the camels and himself actually made it to like an oasis type area where there was plenty of food, plenty of shade, lots of water. I'm sure there were some fresh fruits. Like just imagine what an oasis was. And then he gets into Babylon and he's had this determination. He's made it through this bout in the desert. And so it's, it tells you that his very first step on tablet number one, his very first step is to set aside a 10th of all that he keeps as his own to save and then to live off of seven tenths, all right? Then we go to tablet number two, and this is to take the remaining two tenths and start distributing it equally amongst those that he is in indebted to until they're all paid off. So it goes on in that tablet, in tablet number two, and lists every single person he owes money to. So there's a good exercise for you. If you want some homework, a takeaway from this, do that. Make your tablet number two. Figure out how much is two-tenths of what you make, and then I want you to distribute it in even payments across the board to everyone. That's one way to tackle your debt. Dave Ramsey has a different way. It's a snowball way, but this is another way, and for some people, different ways work better. So tablet number two, he's got all of his debts. He's, he's listed all the people that he has to pay on tablet number two. Tablet number three gives the total amount of money that he owes to his creditor as 190 pieces of silver and 140 pieces of copper. I'm guessing back then it's a long time ago. So tablet number two, he decided he was going to pay two tenths of what he made to his creditors and he listed all of his creditors, right? Now tablet number three, he's made a running total of how much money he owes. He's figured out exactly how much silver and exactly how much copper. And then it goes on to tell that he told each of his creditors that he had no way to repay them 
other than his ability to earn. I talked to you about that a minute ago. And he explained his plan to each. So to each one, hey, you have stables. I'm going to work off my debt and you pay me whatever the fair wage is that you pay those that work in your stables until I'm done. Or I'm making X amount of dollars doing this new camel herding thing, but it's barely enough to get by, but I'm still going to pay you this portion of two tenths of what I make until my debt's paid off in full, right? So some of those men were happy that he'd returned and was working off those debts. And some of those men reviled him and scorned him. I talked to you guys about that already. It's just going to happen. Like some people are going to receive it well that you're making an effort. You're going to call some of those credit cards and try to work out a deal. Some of them are going to be so kind and appreciative of your effort. Some of them are going to be rude and they're going to treat you like a deadbeat nobody who can't afford squat. But you just have to put on that armor of determination and keep pressing forward. So tablet number four is a month after that last tablet, okay? And uh, Dabasir now has 19 pieces of silver from his job as the camel herder. And he's following his plan. One tenth is his, seven tenths is for the family, and two tenths is split up as evenly as possible amongst his creditors. And after the first month, his debt has shrunk nearly four silver pieces. All right, so that doesn't seem like a lot when he had a hundred and whatever pieces, but it is. And, and he has two for himself because he's saving a tenth. That's one month. He's got two pieces of silver and he has four pieces of silver paid off in debt. That's a good thing. So the tablet also chronicles his financial state during the next couple of months as a herder. Um, the next month isn't so good, but he kept on working. He kept following the law of one tenth his own, two tenths to creditors and seven tenths to keep the family stable. And then like, I think the third or fourth month, it's awesome because he makes 42 pieces of silver. That is so much more than he was making. So imagine taking one tenth of that to keep, um, seven tenths of that to live off of, and then getting to take the two tenths of those 42 pieces and pay back those creditors, right? He paid off a large chunk of debt with that. So that's exciting. Then we move into tablet number five. This is the fifth and final tablet. Um, this finds us a year later. Dabasir has paid off his final debt in its entirety following this system. One tenth, two tenths, seven tenths, right? And he's, he's paid it all off. And to his surprise, those creditors that were so um, reviled and like scorned him and were not nice, those ones that I said were going to be rude on the phone, they were proud of him for finally paying off what he had owed. So maybe, maybe they'd been burned and like lent money to somebody and they weren't paid off, so they were a little bitter and he got to feel the end of that. But he also got to feel what it felt like when those people made a complete turnaround and we never expected them to. So he's really happy. He's glad to have the respect in his home. He gives all of his ability... Um, Gives all the credit to pay off the debt to his plan, that plan of one tenth, two tenths, seven tenths. And um, I think it's just so funny because that's, that same chapter ends with a letter from Alfred to the professor again, telling him that, hey, I did what Dabasir did and I've also paid off all my debts. So I think it's just the author's way of throwing in there, if you follow this system, like pounding it into our head, you will get out of debt and you do understand the laws of acquiring wealth. If you can understand one tenth to yourself, two tenths to the creditors or savings, once those are all paid off, and seven tenths to live off of, the sky is the limit. It's just a matter of having discipline. So, you know, the chance that these clay tablets are real is not probable. It's kind of suspect, but I think, you know, just like I was saying, I think the letters in the beginning and the end of the chapter are simply there to convey to the reader that following this method does in fact work. So the last, I'm going to move right on. I'm sorry to transition quickly, but the last story is about the luckiest man in Babylon. And y'all, this is a long story and you need to read it because it is totally applicable to our beach body businesses or whatever businesses it is that you go out and pursue and try to become profitable with. This story is all about hard work, and that's, that's really the end of it. It's the story of Sharunada and uh, Arad Gula and purchasing slaves, and in the end, this guy ends up freeing this one slave, and it's, it's impactful. I would encourage, I just want to encourage you guys to read it, because it would take me an entire Zoom to walk through the story with you, but I will sum it up. So it's all about hard work. When Sharunada adopted this guy's stance that hard work could set you free, literally could set you free from being a slave, it began a chain of events in his life that did exactly that. So the same principle goes for anybody that wants to create wealth. You can't save one-tenth of everything you earn when you're not earning anything. 
me say that again. You cannot save one tenth of all you earn when you're not earning anything. So aside from that, the harder you work at anything, the better you will get at it and the more opportunities that will come to you. The harder you work in your beach body business, the better you're going to get at it and the more opportunities you're going to have to change lives. The better or the harder you work at becoming an instructor or teaching classes or helping people get fit or being a personal trainer or being a financial advisor or owning a gym or being an accountant or I don't know, insert your profession there. The harder you work at that, the better you're going to get just simply because of repetition and the more opportunities you're going to have. Therefore, you become the luckiest man in Babylon, right? So we follow these laws. We work our fannies off. We work our fannies off, literally. And we understand that with hard work, we're going to get better and that as we get better, we're going to have more opportunities to seize and we press on. So matter how no matter how hard things seem right now, like, I don't know, times are tough for a lot of people, no matter how hard things seem or how dire your straits are, the message is to cling to your hard work. The message is to cling to your system that works one tenth to yourself, two tenths to creditors slash savings and seven tenths to live off of. If I can get that in your head, we've done good. Okay. And hard, hard, hard work. Luck is seizing the opportunity to work more. So don't sit at home and say, I have the worst luck with my online fitness business. Oh, I don't make any sales. I don't do this. Chances are, if you're sitting on your couch thinking all of those things, you're not sitting on your couch or at your desk reaching out to people. The more you reach out to people, the more you're going to realize what works and what they respond to and what people want from you because you are what they want. Not Beachbody. They want you. But the more you put yourself out there, the better at it you're going to get and the more opportunities you're going to have. So I just want you guys, if you have learned anything from this book, anything, it's to save a tenth of what you earn. Save a tenth. Save a tenth. It like needs to be a shirt. Like save a child, save a tenth. We should make shirts. That would be so fun. And then to work hard to understand that luck, in essence, is seizing the opportunity to fall upon better luck. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, don't invest your money in things you don't know about or with somebody who does not know anything about what it's being invested in. Please protect that that you earn. Please make sure you have insurance to cover your family. There are so many things that this book touched on and is so awesome. And I hope that you guys read it. I really do because the gold is in the banter of these people. So what we're gonna do is this is our final Zoom. Um, I think it will be our final Zoom for the year. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and plan out 50 weeks of content for next year. And I will post on one topic per week and I'll have a Zoom maybe twice a month in this particular group. What I would like is when I post this replay, I would love for you guys to comment underneath topics that you would like me to touch on. I don't care if it's grocery store savings or um, municipal bonds, like <laughs> those are two totally different things. Like I, I don't care if it's learning tips to save money when you're shopping for clothes for your kids or if it's something as complex as I want a variable annuity. You know what I mean? Like I wanna know whatever it is you guys are thirsty to know and I'd like to go ahead and plan out next year and really add some value. So I cannot thank you guys enough for taking the time out of your busy holiday week to be here or to watch the replay. I have so enjoyed going through this study with you guys. And don't be strangers. I am wrapping up my year-end investment account reviews, so I'm pretty busy doing that. But if any of you wanted to talk about anything at all, my office is in South Lake. I'm happy to meet you face-to-face. I can also set up a private Zoom meeting like this and we can discuss, you know, what it is that is pertinent to your life right now. So thanks again for being here. I hope that you've enjoyed this study of the richest man in Babylon and comment in our group and let me know what you want to learn about in 2016. Be blessed.